Journey of the Sparrows, Chapter 8 The next day, Alicia's husband went to a legal aid office to try and get news of her, but he learned nothing. He returned to the office daily for a week, but got no information. We knew that she would probably be deported, sent home, back to the killings. Our apartment seemed hollow without her. Every night before I went to sleep, I asked God to keep her safe. I looked for work constantly, moving from building to building, asking in Spanish and my new, broken English if there was anything I could do. I got several cleaning jobs for a few hours, and when the church had enough, we ate meals there. Julia's stomach swelled, but she and Oscar grew thinner. I thought, if Oscar's getting this weak in the north, what about Mama and Teresa with even less food? Then Marta got a cleaning job north of the city and began to look for work there for me. We took care of Marta's girls when she worked, and she often went through the rich family's garbage and brought us what food she could. Whenever the men bought food, Julia and I cooked and served it to them and Oscar. When we ate, then we ate what remained. Julia sat most of the time now, with her hands on her belly, her eyes far away. But one afternoon, I glanced over at her and stared. Her face had turned totally white, her eyes bulged, and she moved her hands frantically around her stomach. "'What's wrong, Julia?' I asked urgently. "'I can't feel it. It's not moving,' she began to shake. I rushed her to her and put my hand on her stomach next to hers, tears in my eyes. "'Julia, no! It's got to be alive!' We sat in silence, our faces without color, our hands cupping her belly. Then I felt it. A little arm or leg slid from one side of her stomach to the other. Joyfully, I looked into Julia's eyes. Yes, yes, I feel it, she shouted. It's alive. She threw herself against me and laughed and cried, and we thanked Our Lady. That night, Tomas came over, and the men lent us a pack of cards. Julia, Tomas, and I included Oscar in our game, helping him with his plays. Oscar laughed when he won. I walked with Tomas to the door as he left, and he motioned for me to step into the outside hall with him, away from the men. When he stood alone with me, his face flushed. He brushed his fingers through his hair, and his blue eyes suddenly seemed unsure. I felt shy and looked at the floor. I have something for you, Tomas said, and I looked up. He put his hand in his pocket and pulled out a small gold locket on a chain. I stared at it and stuttered. But Papa and Mama, I don't know if they'd let me take it. Don't worry, it's not worth much money. You couldn't sell it for anything, Thomas sputtered nervously. Just a little present. He pressed it into my hand, turned, and hurried down a few stairs. I, I wanted you to have something pretty, he said, looking upward at me. His face still seemed strange, but his eyes were warm again, like the sun. Before I could respond, he went down the rest of the stairs and stepped outside. Oscar was nearly asleep and Julia was next to him when I returned to our mattress. I didn't know what to say. Julia patted the mattress next to her so I would sit down. You look different, she said. Did something happen? I sat next to her and opened my clenched hand. Never had I been so shy with my sister. Tomas gave it to me. It's just a present. He said he wanted me to have something pretty. Julia reached for the necklace and held the gold chain with the little heart looped in her hand. It's lovely, she said. Would Papa be mad, I whispered. No, little sister, she laughed gently. I held up my long hair and Julia helped me fasten it around my neck. Papa'd know how different things are up here. He'd be glad you have a friend. I felt warmth spread through my body. When I looked in the mirror, it was as if my neck had been touched by light. I was so pleased my whole body was singing. Tomas didn't join us at the church when we ate there the next night, so we assumed he was working. The next afternoon, we heard a knock on the door. The men were gone, and no one usually came at this time. Leaving the chain lock on, I opened the door a few inches. Tomas stood there. My hand went to the locket around my neck, and I smiled and felt a little dizzy. I just heard of another church where they give out food, Tomas said as he came in. He turned to Julia. You don't eat there. They give you groceries. I can only leave my job for a few minutes, so we've got to go quickly. I can take Maria. Gracias, Tomas, Julia said. So, 
We hurried down the stairs and ran down the street. When we stopped for cars, I tried to talk. I didn't get a chance to thank you for the necklace. Looks real nice, he said, his eyes smiling as he looked directly at me. Dark clouds were building, and a wind began to blow as we hurried to a high-domed church I'd never seen before. When we got there, the line was long. Tomas fingered a strand of his hair as we stood at the end of the line. Is Julia doing okay, he asked. I guess so, but she and Oscar don't have enough to eat. I don't know what else to do. I'm scared for them all the time. I understand, he said. Not enough food at home or here. We stood close together in silence, our arms nearly touching. I've got to leave now, Thomas finally said. If I don't, my boss will be mad. Your English is better. Try to tell them you need food for us, too. He squeezed my shoulder. Good luck. Gracias, I said, my hand against the locket as he left. The wind wailed as Tomas turned the corner, and a few minutes later it began to rain. I stood looking up at the rain, thinking of how much I used to love the sound of it as it splattered on the clay roof of our house at home. The line moved over against the building, but there was no protection. The air smelled clean and sweet, but we all got wet and cold. I closed my eyes, and when I opened them, I saw the Kitsal lady in her golden green shawl. She was muttering at the sky with a newspaper over her head and buggy. She looked around and saw me. Well, dearie, it's you. Where's the boy? He's home. I'm trying to get food for him and my sister. She didn't respond to me, but turned her face back over her shoulder into the rain. Look at this little drenched sparrow, she said, and started to laugh. Well then, for heaven's sake, give her some newspapers, you silly woman. I am, I am, don't rush me. She poked through the newspapers covering the buggy and tossed them aside, bent down and came up with some dry paper. Put this over your head, dearie, she said to me. As I did what she said, a woman came out of the church door onto the steps. She opened her hands to the sky and shrugged as if she was helpless and spoke in English. I couldn't understand what she said, but the people in the line said, no, no, and began pushing forward. The woman at the door shouted this time, and I understood. No more, no more, gone. My tears mixed with the rain. The Quetzal lady watched the line break up, then beckoned to me with her finger. Come with me, dearie. She said loud enough for me to hear her over the rain. No, I said, I've got to get them to listen to me. I'll bang on the door. Come with me, you silly girl. I'll show you the secret way. So I followed her in the rain as she shuffled along the side of the church and down an alley. Rain like this could bring hail, she grumbled as we walked. Hail be as big as hen eggs at home. Could beat the devil out of you. The back of the church was surrounded with a high fence and a locked gate. The Quetzal lady led me to where a low building reached out to the street. Climb the fence here, follow the roof, and go down along the wall. They got a window they keep open to get air. Then you can just take a little food from the kitchen. She laughed to herself. Full belly, satisfied heart. How do you know about it? Used to sleep and eat here myself. Tickled me to stay inside. I was right there when all that holy stuff went on, before I got too stiff. Had some good times back in there, didn't we? She said back to the rain. Well, well, she shook her hands like a fan. Time to pass on the secrets. Don't others know about it? I asked. From me? Flies don't enter a clothes mouth, she answered primly, her neck high and her dark eyes disdainful. She steadied me as I climbed up the fence and over the wet roof, where I turned toward her. Well, bye for now, dearie, she said. Gotta get on with our work. I followed her directions, the rain splattering against me, and finally came to a partly open window, which I pushed with the palms of my hands until it opened far enough for me to climb inside. I dropped quietly through the window into a dim and empty room and glanced around, wiping the rain from my face with the back of my arms. My heart pounding, I hurried down a hall until I came to a kitchen and looked inside. The light was on, and the radio played, but no one was there. I began opening cupboards, looking for food, but there was none, just empty plastic containers. Finally, in a drawer, I found a half loaf of bread. I grabbed it, pushed the drawer back shut, and heard voices in the hall. Panicked, I hid in a supply closet. Two women came into the kitchen, talking so fast in English, I couldn't understand. 
Pray for us sinners, pray for us sinners, I said to myself. The women left the room. I hurried back into the first room, but I realized I couldn't climb back up. Out of the window, and I looked around again in panic. There was only the hall. Shivering from my wet clothes, I crept back down the hall and went up some steps to the right. At the top of the stairs, I slowly opened a door and stepped into the sanctuary of the church. My hand holding the bread bag dropped to my side. I stared forward in awe. I knew there were churches like this in Mexico, but I'd never been in one. The room was enormous, and slanted prisms of light beamed down from stained glass windows. There was a carving of Jesus on the cross at the altar, flanked by candles, flowers, and flags. I saw a large statue of Our Lady standing serenely in a huge foyer to the side. She was held up by a carved angel, wore a red gown and a blue and white robe, and was backed by gold, like the rays of the sun. My mouth dropped. She was so beautiful. I walked toward her, my feet making no sounds on the carpet. Candles in wine, blue and green glass holders, flickered in front of her, and flowers were laid at her feet. Her eyes were gentle and peaceful, and her delicate mouth was like a pink lily. Oh, Our Lady, I said out loud, you can make Oscar and Julia strong. You can bring Mama and Teresa. I reached for a match to light a candle, but saw a wooden box with an opening for coins. I looked down at my hands. Not only did I have no money for a candle, I was also holding a stolen bag of bread. I flushed scarlet under Our Lady's eyes and dropped the bread. Then I heard the voice. May I help you? The man said in Spanish. I turned. The voice came from a tall, thin, red-haired man, wearing the collar of a priest. The blood left my face. My name is Father Jonathan, he said. I didn't know anyone was inside here. He glanced down and saw the bag of bread. I closed my eyes and felt his hands on my arms, as if he was keeping me from falling. Come with me to my office, he said. I followed him into a crowded room, picturing the guardias and my arrival home. He wrapped a coat around my wet clothes and motioned me to a chair. I sat down, empty inside. Why did you take the bread? He asked, sitting down behind a desk. We're hungry, I said, and then stopped myself. No, I'm hungry, by myself. Where are you from? Texas. I tried to answer his questions, but I knew he knew I was lying. The blood finally came back to my face and burned me like wine. Finally, he said, Child, I'm not going to turn you in. I'm here to help people like you. On my honor as a priest, let me help you. I looked up into his eyes. They were slanted and blue with no eyelashes, but they seemed kind. He had a long neck, a blonde red beard, and was twirling a pencil around and around with the fingers of one hand. Tell me, he said again, and he took off his brown-rimmed glasses, wiped them with a handkerchief, and put them back on. First, where are your parents? I thought of Alicia and Isabel's aunt sent back to the killings. Then I pictured how terribly thin Julia and Oscar were becoming. I glanced at him again, took a deep breath, and whispered, Mama's in Mexico. Papa's dead. Your father died recently? I nodded. What happened? The guardias, I said. I saw Father Jonathan stiffen as he heard the term, and he wiped his forehead with his hand. El Salvador? I nodded again. Stammering, I told him our story, but I didn't tell him where we lived, and he didn't ask me. Finally, he rubbed his hands down his legs as if in pain, took off his glasses again, and looked intently into my eyes. Not everyone here agrees with immigration, or backs the guardias. Some of us are trying to change things, to make it legal for people like you. You are, I said, my mouth wide open. Not everyone backs immigration? No, many people don't agree. We're trying to figure out what to do to change things. Tears came to my eyes. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Father Jonathan bent forward in his chair and started twirling the pencil again. We help as many people as we can here, with food and sometimes medicine, but we keep running out of money. He paused. Tears were running down my cheeks. But for now, he said, pressing his hands against the desk, I'll give you some food for today, and if you come every day for a few hours, we'll pay you to clean. He smiled sadly. 
and give you some food when we've got it. I'm only here part-time, though, and sometimes I'm gone. He paused again. There's so many people. He looked around the room, twisted his long fingers together, and cracked his knuckles. I keep thinking, there just must be some better way to help people like you. Gracias, I whispered. You won't turn us in? He shook his head and smiled gently. No, I'll try to help you as much as I can. Go back and finish your prayers, Maria. You can use a candle. I'll go get some aspirin and some food for today. I went back into the church and fervently thanked Our Lady.